Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and I'm here at 17 Wing in Winnipeg having a look at yet another fascinating piece of World War II aerial navigation equipment. This is a Mark II drift recorder. This would have been used by a navigator to determine the effects of wind on an aircraft's course, i.e. its drift. Now, this particular model was built in Canada for use by the Royal Canadian Air Force, but an almost identical drift site called the B-5 was also used by the U.S. Army Air Force and the U.S. Navy. Now, the modern drift site was invented by Australian navigator Harold Gaddy, who, in 1931, along with pioneering American aviator Wiley Post, circumnavigated the globe by air from New York to New York in 8 days, 15 hours, and 51 minutes. So the drift site that Gaddy invented for this flight took the form of a periscope that stuck out horizontally from the fuselage of the aircraft, allowing the navigator to look straight down at the ground. And inside this periscope was a loop of clear film with lines drawn on it at regular intervals, driven at a constant speed between two spools by motor. And how the navigator used this is he would look through the eyepiece and he would adjust the height of the eyepiece until objects on the ground seemed to be moving at the same speed as the lines on the film. This meant that the ground and the film formed part of the same giant similar triangle. And then all the navigator had to do was use the altitude of the aircraft provided by the instruments and a table of pre-calculated values to determine the aircraft's ground speed. And following this record-breaking flight, Gaddy progressively refined the design of his site, which was eventually sold to both private aviation outfits as well as the U.S. Army Air Force. And they further refined and simplified the design over the following decades, including removing the cumbersome moving film strip system. And the result was simplified drift sites like the Mark II. So let's actually have a closer look at this and see how it actually works. Right, so just like Harold Gaddy's original design, this is a periscopic sight that sticks out from the side of the aircraft, though at a 15 degree upwards angle as opposed to horizontal. And this would be mounted on a special bracket in the navigator's compartment on rails so that it could be extended or withdrawn from the port in the side of the fuselage. So on the left side of the eyepiece, we have a little circular slide rule here, but we'll get to how that works in just a second. Now, on the other side, we have a frosted glass disc in a rotating bezel, which is marked with degrees along the top. And this sits over a white plastic disc etched with parallel reference drift lines. Now, if I might take a little bit of a tangent here, this disc may be made out of something called ivorine, which is a form of celluloid that was used in other navigational instruments of the period, including the bubble sextants that we had a look at in a previous video. Though ivorine tends to yellow and degrade significantly with age, but this disc is in perfect condition, so I'm willing to bet that it's actually made out of something called galolith which is an earlier plastic which is made by treating casein, which is a protein found in milk, with formaldehyde. And this was, and still is, made mainly in countries with a large dairy industry because it's a convenient way of using up surplus milk. However, if it's formed into anything thicker than a thin sheet like this, it tends to warp and crack. And so this is typically used for stamping out small objects like shirt buttons, or in this case, parts of a navigational instrument. So just thought that was a neat thing to point out. Right, so also on this side of the site, we have this little collar on a moving arm, and this is intended to hold a pencil like so. And then if we open up the cover by lifting this latch, we can see the mechanism inside. So we have a lens with a reticle, and this reticle consists of four parallel drift lines and two ground speed lines. And this lens is mechanically linked with the frosted glass disc, so that if you rotate one, the other rotates along with it. Now inside the cover here, we have a little cursor, which is tipped with a ball of radioluminescent radium paint, so it can be used at night. And as I've said in previous videos, this no longer glows in the dark, but not because the radium is no longer radioactive. Radium has a half-life of 1600 years, but because the phosphor has degraded. So this is still very radioactive, and so if you have one of these, try not to get the dust on your fingers or inhale it or ingest it. Just generally be careful. And this cursor is attached to the pencil collar with a pantograph mechanism, which scales the motion so that the motion of the cursor across the lens and reticle matches the movement of the pencil across the frosted glass disc. Right, so how you would use this is you would look through the eyepiece at the ground below and you would choose a reference object. And this could be anything. This could be a bridge, a building, a mountain, a bend in the river. 
anything that you can easily keep track of. You would then use the cursor to track this object as it drifted across the ground below you. And in so doing, you would scribe a pencil line across the frosted glass disc. You would do this a couple more times until you had a series of parallel lines across the disc. Then you would rotate the disc until those lines lined up with the reference lines on the plastic disc below and then read off your drift angle from the scale. Right, so that's how you figure out your drift angle. Now you need to figure out your ground speed. And to do this, you line up the reticle so that the drift lines are parallel to the apparent motion of the ground. And you pull out a stopwatch and you time how long it takes for a reference object to travel between the two parallel ground speed lines. You then go over to the little circular slide rule on the other side of the site, told you we'd be coming back to it, and you align the elapsed time you just measured in seconds with your aircraft's altitude in feet, which would come from the aircraft's instruments. And it will output your ground speed in either miles per hour or knots. And now that you have these two data points, your drift angle and your ground speed, you can then construct a wind triangle, which is a vector addition that allows you to determine the direction and strength of the wind. And then the pilot can then use this to compensate for wind drift by crabbing into the winds so that the aircraft follows the desired ground track. Now, savvy viewers might be wondering at this point, since an aircraft's altimeter only gives you a pressure altitude above a certain datum, typically the airfield where you took off, how do you actually determine your altitude above the ground if you don't happen to know where you are, especially if you're flying over mountainous terrain or another area where the altitude of the ground differs significantly from where you took off. Well, I have it on the good authority of a former instructor of celestial navigation that you just guess. Just like with navigating by sextant, you give yourself a dead reckoning position, which is where you think you are, and you continuously refine this position as you go along and collect more data. And that is how you navigate using a Mark II drift recorder. Now, by all accounts, instruments like this were very robust and effective, but they all suffered from one fundamental flaw, which is that they were not stabilized against the rolling and pitching of the aircraft. And this could introduce error via angular distortion. And so a number of more sophisticated drift sites with gyro stabilization were developed, like this one. This is a B3, or more specifically, a Type 2924-2A-A gyroscopically stabilized drift site. This was manufactured by Pioneer Instruments, which was a division of the Bendix Corporation, and was used by the United States Army Air Force, the U.S. Navy, and the Royal Canadian Air Force throughout the Second World War and for a few years afterward. This particular example comes from the navigation school here at CFB Winnipeg and would originally have been mounted in a C-47 aircraft, which were used as navigation trainers in the 1950s and 60s. And as you can see, this example has been mounted on a stand for classroom use, though while this is in a gimbal mounting to demonstrate the action of the gyroscope, in actual use, this would be solidly bolted to the floor of the aircraft, and only the internal optics would be gyroscopically stabilized, though we'll have a look at that in just a second. So the procedure for using the B3 drift sight is very similar to that for the Mark II, but with two main differences, one having to do with the gyroscopic stabilization system, and the other with the fact that you're not actually looking straight down at the ground. Rather, you are looking through an index prism, which is mounted at the end of the periscope, whose angle can be varied using this index knob. And this affects the procedure for determining your ground speed. Right, so the first thing you want to do in order to use this is to uncage or unlock your gyroscope. So during takeoff, landing, violent maneuvers, or turbulence, the gyroscope would be locked in place to protect it from damage. And you unlock it by pulling out and swinging over this knob. And now you can start up the gyroscope. And you do this by flipping this toggle switch and then pressing and holding down the start button for around a minute, which gives the gyroscope time to power up. Now, once your gyroscope is up and running, you can then look through the eyepiece. Now, this is currently fitted with a one power eyepiece, which was standard, but you could also swap that out for a three power eyepiece, which is typically mounted on this bracket at the bottom here. And although this gives you a more detailed view of the ground, it also reduces your field of view from 25 degrees down to 11 degrees. And then to adjust the focus on the eyepiece, you would rotate this neural section. Now, looking through this, what you would see is an image of the ground below, 
with an illuminated reticle superimposed on top of it. And to adjust the brightness of the reticle, you turn this rheostat knob here at the top. And then if the image is too bright, say you're flying over snow and ice in the middle of the day, you can drop a shade glass in the periscope by pulling down on this lever. To determine your drift angle, you would look through the eyepiece and you would turn this azimuth knob until objects on the ground move parallel with the drift lines in the reticle. You would then read your drift angle off of the azimuth dial. Now, if you want to move the azimuth dial more quickly than by turning the knob, you can actually pull the knob out, pull it to the side, and now you can rotate the head freely. Now, to determine your ground speed, you can use one of two procedures, the first of which is nearly identical to that used in the Mark II drift sight. So, while looking through your eyepiece, you would adjust your azimuth knob until the drift lines on the reticle align with the movement of the ground below. You would then pull out a stopwatch and time how long it takes for a reference object on the ground to travel between the two ground speed lines. Now, this doesn't come with its own built-in slide roll, but the calculation for ground speed is simplicity itself. You simply divide your altitude in feet by the elapsed time that you just measured in seconds. However, since you're looking at the ground at an angle through the index prism, this is going to induce a certain amount of error. Thankfully, the manual for the B3 provides a table of correction values to compensate for the angle of the prism. And there are two types of these values. The K values are used to give your ground speed in knots, while the C values are used to give your ground speed in miles per hour. So for example, if your index prism was set at 16.9 degrees, your K factor for knots will be 0.176, whereas your C factor for miles per hour will be 0.203. So the second procedure for determining your ground speed is a little bit more involved, but gives far more direct results. So this time, rather than simply watching a reference object drift across your reticle, you're instead going to track it using your index and your azimuth knobs to keep that object in the middle of the reticle. And as you turn your index knob, you're going to hear a click. And this is a detent indicating that you have reached 50 degrees. And this is when you start your stopwatch. And as you continue to turn, you're going to hear a second click, which indicates that you have reached 70.9 degrees. This is when you stop your stopwatch. You then simply divide your altitude in feet by your elapsed time in seconds that you've just measured, and this will directly give you your ground speed without needing to apply any sort of correction factor. And that is how you use the B3 drift sight. So let's actually take this apart and see how it works. So if we remove uh, the top dome here, we'll find the first part of the system, which is a three volt incandescent lamp and a set of condenser or collimator lenses. Now I've previously discussed this in my video on reflector gun sights, but collimator lenses take the spreading light rays from a light source and refract them so that they are collimated, they are parallel. So the collimated light beam from the lamp travels down through this etched reticle, which is tinted red to preserve the navigator's night vision. It then goes down into this prism and is refracted sideways. Now, the prism itself is mounted to the case of the instrument, while the reticle is mounted to the gyroscope. And what the gyroscope does is it keeps the reticle image parallel to the ground below, no matter the motion of the aircraft, at least up to 25 degrees. And this has the effect of aligning the reticle image within the optical system that has the same effect as gyroscopically stabilizing the entire instrument relative to the aircraft while being a lot more robust and easy to implement. Right, so let's take a bit of a tangent to discuss the gyroscope itself. This is a Pioneer AN3 gyroscope, which rotates at 10,600 RPM and is powered by a split phase condenser motor. So how this motor works is that there are two windings, a primary and a secondary, and the secondary winding is attached to a set of condensers or capacitors. And what these capacitors do is shift the secondary winding current waveform by 90 degrees. This creates a rotating magnetic field which induces eddy currents in the rotor and causes it to spin. So this motor required a 110 volt 400 hertz power supply in order to work. However, since aircraft at the time typically had a 24 volt DC electrical system, this was supplied with a special rotary inverter to produce the required power. Now, later versions of the B3 drift site, like this one, were fitted with a special startup transformer to help start up the gyroscope in cold weather. 
and this supplied 220 volts temporarily when the starting button was pressed. And then when the starting button was released, it would switch over to the regular 110 volt power supply. So one last thing to mention regarding this gyroscope is this ball bearing that runs around a circular track at the top. This is what's known as an erection mechanism, giggity, which is designed to keep the gyroscope pointed vertically. Now, gyroscopes tend to stay in the orientation that you leave them. That's kind of the point. But as an aircraft starts to maneuver, the gyroscope will eventually start to drift and finally tumble unless there is some sort of mechanism to slave it in the correct orientation, in this case, vertically. So what happens here is that when the gyroscope tilts, the ball bearing is going to roll to the lowest point. And this is going to induce a torque on the gyroscope axis, which is going to cause it to spiral back up towards the vertical. So a very simple but very clever little mechanism. Right, so carrying on along the optical path, the image of the reticle will emerge from the gyroscope prism and enter another prism inside this housing, which is going to flip it back around through 180 degrees. It then enters a beam splitter, which reflects it up into the eyepiece. Now, at the same time, the image of the ground is going to travel through the index prism and up the periscopic sighting head through a series of focusing lenses until it reaches the same beam splitter with both beams the reticle image and the ground image arriving in the eyepiece at the exact same time so that both are simultaneously in focus. And that is how the B3 drift sight works. Now, before I end the video, I do want to point out that there's several different versions of these that were manufactured. The second version differed from the first in the design of the azimuth gearing system, whereas the third version introduced the startup transformer, which we previously discussed. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on another video where we'll look at yet more fascinating navigation instruments and other devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.